All right, so hello and welcome back. So today we're gonna to be checking out how did Britain lose to the American Revolution in animated history by the armchair historian. This is going to be the in-depth version. If you don't like me pausing and we're telling you about this stuff, then the original video is in the description and go watch there. And please give them a like because they do amazing work. Otherwise, um, yeah, we're gonna to react to this and I'm an American, so hopefully I know some of my military history about this. Um, do I know absolutely everything? Probably not, but hopefully I give you some insight. So without further ado, let's get to it. This video was made possible entirely by our supporters on Patreon. Special thanks to my top patrons, Fritz, Joe Crispin, Brandon Wuwan, and Derek Bello. The following account is from Lieutenant Jay Waller of the 1st Battalion Royal Marines at Bunker Hill. March. Two companies of the 1st Battalion of Marines and part of the 47th Regiment were the first that mounted the breastwork. Don't fire until you see the of their and eyes, you will not be men. displeased when I tell you that I was Take with those two aim. companies Steady, lads. who drove their bayonets into all that opposed them. Fire. Nothing could be more shocking than the carnage that followed the storming of this work. We gained a complete victory. And just remember, he's a Royal Marine writing this, some of the Royal Marine commandos today. Also, I like the fact that this flag is the appropriate flag for the New England militia, which is very good. The Battle of Bunker Hill was one of the many gruesome battles of the American Revolution, a war that lasted a total of eight years, approximately the same length as the American Civil War, Spanish-American War, and Mexican-American War combined. It's clear then that in many ways the American Revolution was a war of attrition, but unlike prevailing belief, the war was not won simply because the British would fight in lines and the Americans would just hide in the bushes. All of America's most decisive victories were won in a conventional manner, but it was in the way that the Americans engaged the British, fighting on their own terms, that allowed them to outlast their enemy. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today we'll be evaluating the advantages and disadvantages that both sides faced which ultimately decided the outcome of the war. And that's true. You would be amazed, amazed today. Back when I was taking, uh, wow, this is going back a bit. When I was in high school, United States history. So this is my junior year um, about. So, for example, I played I was like, we needed to do like a, a final project dash simulation of, or like a fun game to play. And we lined up our entire classmates and gave them all little paper balls. And we we're like, all right, very simply, don't move. And we're going to, they're going to throw their balls at you. And then you can get closer and throw their balls at them. And everyone was like, eh, and like, you know, obviously tries to take cover and dodge and stuff. But yeah, no, Americans, every battle that was won, <clears throat> usually was won by the Continental Army. And that makes sense. Your militias are not going to. They're not going to stand toe-to-toe -to, -toe to an actual professional army. It's just not going to happen. Which ultimately decided the outcome of the war. Before we get to the video, I highly recommend you guys check out the channel Japsby on YouTube. He's got a lot of videos on all different wars throughout history. Today he released a video on the Haitian Revolution. I'll actually be narrating one of his videos this month, so be sure to subscribe and check it out. Links are in the description below. To begin this topic, we'll be comparing three categories in order to evaluate who fielded the better army, starting with leadership. The most notable American leader is, of course, George Washington. Appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army in 1775, Washington was quick to take action. He successfully forced the British garrison out of Boston in 1776, but was defeated and almost captured that same year in New York City. Still, his tactical innovation and strategic prowess are proven in the battles of Trenton, Princeton, and Yorktown, to name a few. His his ta tactical brilliance? Hang on, let me... ...and almost captured that same year in New York City. Still, his tactical innovation and strategic prowess are proven in the battles of Trenton, Princeton, and Yorktown. Okay, so strategic prowess and tactical innovations. Okay, let's break this down. I love George Washington. I think he's one of our best presidents, but that's really easy to say, obviously. <clears throat> he did win at Boston. He... this rev the revolution almost died in New York. His entire army was almost completely wiped out, and that was all on him. He's known for Trenton. I give him credit for that. 
Princeton, too. Brandywine is not him at his best. In Yorktown, he had to be convinced by the French to go there because he wanted to go to New York. So, I don't think, controversial opinion, not really, he was not an amazing tactician at all, in any sense, okay? At best, you could say that he was a moderately successful tactician if everything went his way. I would either classify him as moderate or mediocre at best. This man served in the British Army during the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War, depending if you're European or American. He was not very good. He started the war, basically, um, by a misunderstanding and shooting French people, French and Indians. Um, so the whole war was basically what he did, on, a British officer did. And uh, the British didn't promote him because he was stupid and, and incompetent from what they saw and pretty much right. Um, however, just because he wasn't tactically brilliant doesn't mean he wasn't a very good commander in chief. Strategically, he actually was pretty competent. He surrounded himself with a lot of aides that didn't know what they were doing. He was also very good at knowing information about the British positions and everything. You have to watch the series turn very broadly in a dramatized fashion shows the spy network that was what he got his information from. He was very good strategically. I will not discredit him there. Okay. Well, strategically in the wise, I'll just say he's a good strategist, kind of. Not the best in the world, but a good one. Um, and he was able to effectively use spies and everything else at his disposal to enhance his mediocre tactical abilities on the battlefield to help him win. So, strategically pretty good. Because he surrounded himself with a lot of good people, because he was humble, that boosted even more, in my opinion. But tactically, no. No, no, no. I'm to name a few. The next American general is Horatio Gates. Responsible for the American victories at Saratoga, Gates gained recognition early on, but just he didn't do anything at Saratoga. Benedict Arnold won the battle and then got discredited. And this will continue to happen until he turns and switches sides. And he is a traitor. And he still is a traitor in my eyes because he did betray the revolution, whether he did get the glory or not. He betrayed us, so. Just as Gates is remembered for Saratoga, he's also remembered for the major defeat suffered at the Battle of Camden, which was a huge blow to American morale. As a consequence, he was replaced by the much more competent Nathaniel Green. That is true, but we'll get to Nathaniel Green in a minute. He, so you can actually watch the Battle of Camden, a very short clip in The Patriot. Um, yeah, he, he, he tries to fight the Redcoats in a line battle without really French support and loses very badly at Camden. And he continues to run away as fast as possible until he's about 100 miles away from the battlefield and away from his troops. Yeah, no, he was a terrible... Terrible tactician, terrible, terrible everything. Much more competent. And the reason he was able to get this command is because he was very politically connected. That's it. He got the credit for Saratoga, but he didn't actually do anything. That was Benedict Arnold. And then he used that with his political connections in the Continental Congress to get the position of Major General in the South. Um, because they were trying to, he was trying to replace Washington because he saw him as incompetent, if you could believe that. And so then they gave him a command in the South, an independent command, and he lost hard. Nathaniel Green, a favorite of George Washington, who eventually defeated the British in the South. Finally, there's... So, wow, well, that was quick. Okay, so Nathaniel Green is a very good tactical commander and strategic commander. Probably the best commander we have in the American Revolution that's at the major general level. Henry Knox is also up there, but I don't believe he gets to that high. Also, like, Marquis de Lafayette is also up here as one of the good guys um, for our side. And he was French. He wasn't even American. He basically was given an independent command in the South and just starved and beat the British in every battle that he could, that he wanted to fight. Not every battle that he engaged in with the British, but he wanted to basically bleed the British, and that's what he did. And then this culminates in the Battle of Yorktown with him leading them there, basically. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. Who eventually defeated the British in the South. Finally, there's Benedict Arnold, who captured Fort Ticonderoga, a crucial position in upstate New York. This action would soon be overshadowed, however, by his betrayal of the American cause in the middle of the war. Traitor! 
On the British side, we have three significant commanders. The first is William Howe, the man who led the British to their Fyrick victory at Bunker Hill. After the battle, he replaced Thomas Gage as commander-in-chief of the British forces in America. You don't know what Fyrick victory means. That means like you won, technically, but you suffered extraordinarily casualties to do so, like hundreds of them. Or whatever. You suffered a disproportionate amount of casualties for the victory you achieved. Howe would go on to successfully capture Philadelphia, but because of poor communication, this meant that the army of John Burgoyne, another British commander, would be trapped without support and eventually forced to surrender. Shortly after Howe's blunder, he was replaced with Sir Henry Clinton in seven. Okay, so I wouldn't say this was like he didn't understand his orders. No, he understood his orders. He just thought Philadelphia was strategically available and this was more prestigious than going into the woods and helping his other general out. So their plan was basically they were going to cut New York in half through the Hudson River. You cut that, bob it a boop, you split the colonies in two, okay, at least New England. Um, and Burgoyne was coming from the north, and uh, Howe was supposed to come from the south, and Howe didn't do that, and one for Philadelphia, which is like that way, and Burgoyne is coming down this way, and so the Americans were able to pin him down, kill uh, Burgoyne, and then he's like, well, I have Philadelphia. And then he loses Philadelphia eventually. He was replaced with Sir Henry Clinton in 1778. So I wouldn't rate him that highly as a commander, but not bad. Who would remain in the position of commander-in-chief for the majority of the war. The last British commander I'd like to mention is Charles Cornwallis, who was mostly active in New England and the Middle Colonies in the initial stages of the war, but was later reassigned to the Southern Theater, where he made great progress in Georgia and the Carolinas before overextending and being forced to surrender at Yorktown. From this, we can... Okay, he overextended... It. Okay, I still blame him for Yorktown. He did overextend himself there, and he put his position in the back to the sea, okay? Now, this might seem very odd, but here's the, the, the context around this. One, the British Royal Navy doesn't lose. He was expecting to get supplies from the British Royal Navy. They got beat by the French Navy, um, so they didn't come to help him, okay, in the Battle of the Ches Chesapeake Bay, if I remember correctly. Got beat, returned. No supplies from the, from the Royal Navy. Clinton, the commander-in-chief, was also supposed to send him reinforcements. They didn't get there in time because he basically was going to be starved out and completely surrounded. So yeah, his problem for putting his back to the sea, but he did expect some support, so. ...infer that the British generals tended to be more experienced and better educated, although this was negated by the presence of other factors, such as the sheer distance from Great Britain, which delayed the delivery of troops and supplies. In the case of American generals, most of their experience came from the Seven Years' War. This would give them superior knowledge of the terrain. Their main disadvantage would be the lack of organization. I don't know, but okay. The British commanders, yeah, they had a lot more ex education. I'll just give them that. And yeah, he did fight. Mm. This would give them superior knowledge of the terrain. Their main disadvantage would be the lack of organization. In terms of pure tactical ability, American commanders held a slight advantage, as evident in the cunning victories at Trenton and Cowpens. The next cap Trenton and Cowpens are like exceptions, but those exceptions are also at lower level commands. So here's the thing. The I would definitely not agree with this. I would say that the British had the advantage in leadership just all the way up and down. The British had NCOs, okay, and they have NCOs at this point, so non-commissioned officers. They also have officers. Officers can buy commissions, but that's a different video. You can go watch Brandon F. Um, on how that stuff works. But they still did have a far better leadership structure all the way almost to the top. The Americans may have had a slight advantage at the top, but everyone else, they were untrained. They did not have any education. They did not. They had militia experience. But that is very different from being in the regular army um, with their officers and NCOs, and that had to be built up. Now, they say the French and Indian War gave the Americans experience. It also gave the British plenty of experiences, too, because they were also over here and, I don't know, fighting. And the Americans were in militia units that supported the British. So I kind of say that they both learned from that war. As evident in the cunning victories at Trenton and Cowpens. The next category we'll evaluate is troop discipline and tactics. If you've seen any TV documentary on the American Revolution, it's usually stated directly that the Americans were superior in their combat abilities in almost every way just because they utilized guerrilla tactics. And while there is some truth... Mm. 
and that's a horseshit to say the least. To this, it was the Continental Army that won battles, and the irregular troops who retreated from those battles. It's also said that along with the Minutemen, the Riflemen were game changers on the battlefield, but as stated in Battles of the American Revolutionary War 1775-1781 by W.J. Wood, at full strength, the Riflemen could muster some 960 men, less than 3% of the Army's total numbers. I can say confidently then that it's simply untrue that American rifles and militia won the war. The and that is 100% true. The militia usually ran. They have no reason to stay there. They're not, they're not paid. They're not going to stand British fire. And the Continental Army was the real one that were going to win this war. They did. The American militiamen were untrained, under-equipped, and most importantly, unobligated to fight. Oftentimes, they would simply leave and go home if they didn't want to fight anymore. A British redcoat, meanwhile, could fire much more regularly and was more often than not equipped with a bayonet, making for devastating charges. Lastly, the British would always have a detachment of elite grenadiers on the right flank, which would often hey, break the American line, especially if Present. the American forces were composed of militia, as seen at the Battle of Camden. Fire. It's also to be stated when he mentions the bayonet, it's because the British actually had bayonets. Continental Army always had a struggle for bayonets. And since you are so close with a musket, you will get into bayonet fighting. And that's usually how you break people. And the grenadiers on the right, they're the ones that will break the line. That's what their job is. Prime and low. So, I, I agree with this overall. Yeah, NCOs, officers, just the regular troops, and bet just everyone is better trained. Um, now let's talk about this Kentucky long rifle thing, okay? They have 960 men of 3% of the total army numbers. Okay, that is true. I'm not going to argue that number. Um, and that is very small. The effect that they had was disproportionate to the amount of men they had. Every The officers were scared, and so were the NCOs that they would, you know, get shot and die. So let's actually take a look at this long rifle. Okay. So the long rifle, and usually I call it the Kentucky rifle, but you can also call it the Pennsylvania rifle, okay? So designed in around 1700, <laughs> built in around 73,000, is a hunting rifle, okay? So that's this is what this is used for, it's hunting. And we, the reason we don't really know when it was used is because, here's a fun fact, they weren't built in an armory or even a gun manufacturing place. Okay. Most, if not all, of these rifles were handcrafted and hand-built by people in their homes. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but you can still technically do that in the United States because it's, it's not illegal, and this is, this is how the Founding Fathers did it, so you should be able to do it too. And you can technically build rifles. That's what they did back then. Um, and again, they would probably get some of these parts. Right, they might be able to like drill out the the bore and stuff, but like the flint system, they probably had to buy. But the whole wood furniture they could do themselves, and, right, and the triggers and stuff. Um, but basically, this is a rifle. It takes longer to load than a musket, and its caliber is between 0.25 and 0.62, 0 0.40 to 0 0.48 cal is most common. Do you see the disproportionate number spread here? This is because the rifle was not standardized at all. Okay, you could fit whatever caliber of ball you wanted, or, or caliber of basically is the is the bore size of the thing, and you could basically put, depending on how big your caliber was, you could put whatever ball you wanted. Because remember, we didn't have rounded bullets; it was still just a musket ball. Um, and the effective range: a hundred yards, typically to two hundred yards, by an experienced user, and user dependent, usually two minutes around. If your musket men, your muskets could do it around 30 seconds if you're well trained, so two shots per minute. This is usually two rounds a minute. Two plus rounds a minute. If you watch some videos on this, it takes a lot longer than that. Um, even at the best circumstances. So this is a bit, eh. But it's Wikipedia. What are you going to do? Um, so, yeah. It was a hunting rifle, just remember, and it was not meant for, like, really rapid fire, um, but it did do its job, which was basically be a very early sniper rifle. So, back to the video. The last category we'll evaluate is equipment and supplies. 
Infantry equipment was the logistical priority for both the British and American armies. The British were armed with the Brown Bass, a .71 caliber flintlock musket. The Americans, on the other hand, were mainly equipped with the .69 caliber Charleville musket, which was supplied by the French. Both sides did utilize riflemen in the war, but of course the Americans were better known for it, wielding the infamous Kentucky Long Rifle, as seen here. We can say then that the only significant differences between each side's army was that of supply. The British supply lines during the majority of the war were stretched very thin, causing them to stay close to ports to receive reinforcements and foodstuffs. This constraint also prevented the British armies from pursuing the American forces inward. Even when the British could use the ports they captured, getting resupplied and reinforced took one to four months. Despite Britain's logistical constraints, the Americans were in no better a position. Such can be seen at Washington's Valley Forge encampment, where about 2,000 of his 12,000 soldiers died to malnutrition and disease. Losses like this were commonplace in the Continental Army, at least early on. For this reason, the British held a slight advantage in supply. So I disagree when he says slight advantage. It is a massive advantage in supply that they had. Now, I want to show you a lot of stuff, so be ready to bear with me, and we're going to break down why I say that. Okay, so I got a lot of tabs open. We're going to go through this. As they said, the British used the brown vest, and the Americans used the Charlieville. The brown vest, he said, had a .71 cal, and the Charlieville had a .69 cal. We'll get to that point in a minute. But just so you know, the Americans were not able to produce their own rifle at all in any significant number. The first rifle, or sorry, the first musket that we had that was able to be produced was in 1795, many years after the end of the revolution in 1783, let alone 1775 through 1780, which was basically most of the fighting, and then 1781. So I bring this up that we weren't able to build it, and it was basically based on the, the French one, on the 1763-66, okay? So if we go look at the Charleville musket, this thing had been in service from 1717 to 1814, 80, 1840, but eh, about that. What's really concerning here, what we should really pay attention to is not only the caliber, because 0.69 is basically just how big the bore is at the very end, or how much, basically 0.69 of an inch um, is how you can think about that. And that's how big the end of your barrel is and how much stuff you can you can put 0.69 something down it. The French used a cartridge ball, or a cartridge, okay? The musket ball is undersized to 0.65, okay? This means, yes, it would rattle around and fly out the barrel. That's why they were pretty inaccurate. If you used a 0.69, you would you would foul the barrel up, and you would get a little bit more accuracy, but it would foul the barrel up and cause you a whole bunch of problems. And you could not load it as fast. So they reduced the size to 0.65, um, to reduce the effects of powder, uh, powder fouling and, pa and uh, also paper cartridge, where basically you bite it, you know, paper, put it in, bow it a boopy. <clears throat> so just remember, again, so these really have an effective range of around 100 yards, and they have two to three rounds a minute, that I believe, actually. Um, an effective max of firing range is 300 yards. You ain't hitting the broadside of barn at 300 yards with a muzzle loader, I guarantee well, the musket muzzle loader, I guarantee you. Rifle muzzle loader, maybe. Um, but just so you know, 0.65. Now let's look at the brown best. Here's going to be something interesting. The brown best, 1722 to 1851, okay? But here's the thing. They use a caliber of 0.75 to 0 0.80, and their paper cartridge use bucket ball and round size is 0.69, okay? Now, here is the problem that the Continentals ran into. They would eventually be supplied with the by the French rifles in around whenever the French started started to help us, which was like 1776, 1777, 1778, when they started to get a lot of these rifles. Okay. Otherwise, and you can see that their musket, their ball size is 0.65. You're gonna see a problem here. <clears throat> Before then, we had to use basically whatever we captured or big barred and steel. And this is in the case of basically the British, which had a 0.69 ball. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is that if we had the same balls, they couldn't fit in both rifles. You needed one or the other, um, which is going to lead to a logistical nightmare. Well, not nightmare. Very bad logistical problem for the United States because if some units have a Charlieville musket and some units have brown vests, you can see the problem there on supplying them, okay? Next, the Americans could make zero artillery. 
we had not a single artillery foundry. And I'm going to stand by that. Okay. Now you can go to the American Revolutionary War website. Okay. Basically, let me read this verbatim. To win their independence, Americans had to create effective artillery service to be able to challenge British on the battlefield. They had to secure cannon barrels, gun carriages, limbers, ammunition wagons, and a wide variety of other specialized equipment. They had to create a system to maintain the equipment. They had to obtain a steady supply of gunpowder and artillery projectiles, and they had to recruit men, to recruit and train men to serve the guns effectively. To do all of this with little experience or preparation while fighting a war with a major European power, with a well-trained professional army, the world's largest navy, factories to manufacture ammunition, craft facilities to build and maintain equipment, and a well-established system for recruiting and training artillerists. We had none of that. Now, this article basically goes on to say that Henry Knox, you know, he was one of our artillery guys. Yes. What I was going to, what I'm bringing up here is that we did not have a system to have artillerymen trained, which is a science. You have to have to be an artilleryman. You actually did have to go to college <laughs> and learn the engineering skill, um, because that's how it was seen back then. If for the infantry in the British Army, you didn't have to do this, but for the artillery, you did. Um, just like the Navy, I believe so. And we didn't have any of that. We had no artillery college. We didn't even have a foundry. Okay. Um, so we can't build our guns. We can take them, we can capture them, and we can be given them. But we really can't build them. Maybe at the very end of the war, we could start to make a few. But basically, our dealer gun production for the United States doesn't exist. Next major problem, okay? And I bring this up because Washington was always requesting am uh, gunpowder, okay? So let's read this. The supply of gunpowder haunted George Washington and the Continental Congress through the entire Revolutionary War. The vast quantity of powder came from overseas, around 90% from the French colonies in the West Indies. The other 10% was produced domestically, okay? With dwindling powder supplies and only three powder mills in, in operation in all of the colonies, Washington's army around uh, Cambridge was seriously in danger at the start of the war. I bring this up because we only had three powder mills, okay? And they were producing 10% of what we needed, and we were getting 90% from basically the French colonies in the West Indies. So we have, let's, let's review. We have basically no powder production. We have very little, okay? The British 100% are fine, okay? As long as their ships get here, that is the problem. Their ships have to get here. But if they get here... They have powder, they have artillery guns, they have a standardized rifle that uses standardized ammunition, and we don't have any of that. So when I say the Americans were at a massive strategic, uh, massive logistical uphill battle against the British, I really do mean it. So hopefully I added something there. Back to the video. In supply. So with all of this said, the British were better disciplined, well-equipped, and led by somewhat competent commanders, whereas the Americans lost more battles, were short on supplies, undertrained, and only compensated by a few notable commanders. How then did the British lose? Well, we're forgetting two crucial categories, war support and grand strategy. Let's start with war support. The cause of the Patriots had significant support in the colonies. The idea of political... The idea of independence did not have significant support. It had around, at best, 50% of the people wanted independence at the start of the war. This would change throughout the war back into the Americans' favor. But at the start, no, 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 it was not like that. You had a 50% chance of being a loyal independence was highly appealing, much more than that of loyalty to the crown, especially in the north, where British financial restrictions hurt American mer Vermont couldn't itself an independent country and it only became a U.S. state in 1791. Of course Vermont did, they always want to be separate. Merchants. As the war continued, the British were increasingly seen as foreign invaders, and the actions of commanders such as Bannister Tarleton helped support this belief. Despite this, the Patriots were never fully able to control the entirety of the American countryside, as there was a strong core of Loyalist supporters of Great Britain. So Bannerton, Bannerton Tarleton, Tarleton, he's the dude in the Patriot that you all know is when they burned the church, that never really happened, because if that happened, oh my god. Criminy Christmas. If that actually happened, it would skew from 50-50 to like 95% of support in American and 5% against the British. 
and the Americas would run wild with that story. I cannot tell you if that church scene happened in the Patriot, what that would mean for the revolution. Um, absolutely would make the Americans fight to the end. Um, but yes, loyalists, Brennan and Brennan F. Also, these loyalist forces, <clears throat> there was a full on civil war going in the South. In the Southern United States, what will become the United States, the 13 colonies, there is a full out civil war going on between loyalists and um, patriots down there. Full on. You could see like around what the patriot was happening, like the burning of villages and the killings of people that was happening between loyalists and patriots down in the South. It was a full on civil war down there. American countryside, as there was a strong core of loyalist supporters of Great Britain. Internationally, the American cause was more popular, with the French, Spanish, and Dutch all supporting the Patriot cause, though it was more out of a desire to oppose British hegemony than out of appreciation for Republican ideals. Some notable figures who really helped America reform their army were- Before we get to him. Yeah, they weren't in love with the American- they could actually care less whether anything happened to us. Maybe the Dutch liked us a little bit more, they only gave us really money, and that's, I mean, that was a law. And also, here's a fun fact, um, when our boy uh, came down here, John Paul Jones, you know, everyone should know, um, came down here and raided the British Isles with a single ship, he did stop at a Dutch port, and because he didn't have a flag, because he got lost during a battle, that was technically international piracy, so the Dutch made an interesting flag um, that I will try to find and put up on the screen. Um, but yeah, that flag was what the Dutch got from the Americans, um, being like, hey, this is our flag. And it's actually a pretty cool flag. Um, but yeah, the French and the Spanish, uh, well, let's just say this. They wanted to stick it to the British after losing it in the Seven Years War. Uh, that's really why they helped us and why France basically bankrupted itself to get us to uh, beat the British. Baron von Steuben and Marquis de Lafayette. Something I find really interesting is that the largest battle of the American Revolution was actually fought at Gibraltar, and though the British came out victorious, it's just one of many examples of how overextended Britain became as America received more and more international support. Indeed, the British saw- And that is true. Um, the war really was starting to become international. Also, Baron von Steuben, I heard this a long time ago from the History Channel when it actually did history back then, I think. Baron von Schleppen was basically, the reason he came over here is because he was exiled from Prussia. If I remember correctly, it was because he was gay. Um, and he very much influenced us during um, Valley Forge and actually got our army from militia to actually at least decently well trained so that we could fight the British. So he, he should get a lot of credit there. And of course, Marquis de Lafayette. The French boy that is always popularized and actually an American citizen, if I remember correctly, by uh, presidential order. Him, Churchill, and I believe one other person are have been granted like American citizenship um, because of their contributions to our country. The American Revolution was actually fought at Gibraltar, and though the British came out victorious, it's just one of many examples of how overextended Britain became as America received more and more international support. Indeed, the British saw virtually no foreign support during the Revolution. The Kingdom of Hanover was also in a personal union under Great Britain, making it the only European country to join the war on the British side, not including mercenaries from Hessian, or Hessian mercenaries, basically German mercenaries. And yes, this is exactly where the Kingdom of Hanover is. And it wasn't a personal union with the monarchs of, of England because, fun fact, they were German. With regards to strategy, the Americans had the edge compared to the British, even if it changed as the war continued. At the outbreak of hostilities, the American army fought in a conventional manner, engaging the British on their own terms, and even launching some attacks into Britain's Canadian territories. Needless to say, most of these attacks failed, severely crippling American military strength. Now they didn't just fail, they were utterly, utterly, utter failures. <laughs> um, kind of would have been interesting if we actually did win, because maybe America would have actually got Canada back then, because Canada's population was tiny back then. Um, one of those interesting what-ifs if American actually won this battle, but no, we did not.
The British strategy initially was to secure the cities of New England, thinking that once the capital of the revolution fell, so too would the morale of the patriots. Although they did capture most of New England, they were poorly coordinated. This could be seen when William Howe left Burgoyne in upstate New York to face the Continental Army while he captured Philadelphia. He underestimated the strength of the Americans, and what followed was one of the largest British military disasters of the time. Basically because he went boop, 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 boop into Philadelphia, the Americans were like, okay, bet, and we'll just go kill the British, and that's exactly what they did. As Burgoyne lost his whole army and was captured. Howe also found that even though Philadelphia was occupied, the Americans hadn't lost their will to fight. After realizing his strategy was not fit for the Americas, he resigned and left Henry Clinton in charge. The second phase of the war took place in the South, after Clinton realized that the North was too heavily populated with patriots. Washington and Nathaniel Greene had revised their strategy after destroying the British at Saratoga, but unfortunately Horatio Gates learned nothing. Gates engaged General Cornwallis in the South in an open pitched battle and lost a huge portion of his men, after which he was- As the famous patriot saying goes, Gates spent too many damn years in the British army, thinking he can go face to face with redcoats relieved by Nathaniel Green. Cornwallis and his staff, emboldened by their victory, continued to push through Georgia and North Carolina. Learning from his previous mistakes, however, Green slowly pulled Cornwallis away from his supply lines by continuously drawing him into small skirmishes, until Cornwallis was forced to abandon his campaign and retreat to the port of Yorktown, where he was trapped by the French Navy, with Washington expecting him. By viewing the American Revolution as simply a fight between the British soldier and American soldier, all evidence would point to a British victory. But when you factor in that the Americans had help from tens of thousands of foreign soldiers and supplies and were employing brilliant new strategies, you can see that the Americans were able to hold on until the British lost their will to fight. Even though Cornwallis was captured and lost his whole army, the British could have sent another one, but they didn't, because support for the war was virtually gone. And it is for all of these reasons combined that the British suffered such a defeat. And that's an important fact that does make you proud to be an American. We had the sheer will and determination to hold on. That was it. Everything else was needed to make us win. Um, but that absolute sheer will and determination to be an independent country is basically what won us the war in the end. Everything. <laughs> I mean, we weren't going to win. Um, by ourselves at all. It just wasn't going to happen. We had to have all the foreign help to help us with our great determination be able to win. It's for all of these reasons combined that the British suffered such a defeat. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out Jabsy's channel in the description below. Now I'd like to thank my general staff on Patreon. Fritz, Joe Crispin, Brandon Wuwan, Derek Bello, Jake Hart, PJ Knave, Eric Greenwood, Patrick Reardon, John Graham, James Thompson, Jim Talbot, Dimitri Stillerman, Yannick Schwedfiger, and everyone else listed on screen. I'd also like to thank our team, David Mianyar, Hert Boss, and Alexander Blake for making this video possible. I'll see you next time with my video on why soldiers fought in line formations. So. That's a very good video, and if you want to check out that video, uh, give this video a lot of support and like, and I may go check that one out. Um, so hopefully I added something there. I don't know how long this video is, probably over 30 minutes, because I like to hear myself talk, so if you guys give me a like, that'd help. Otherwise, on your screen, it should take you back to my other uh, latest Armchair Historian video if you would like to watch them. Otherwise, you people have a nice day.